Or a simple cycloalkane. Here we have three carbons. They're all SPQ. If this was a three carbon alkane, we would call it propane, right? Well, this is in a ring, a little three membered ring. Therefore, we call this cyclopropane. It is a triangle, and we'll talk about how these bond angles contribute to the reactivity and inherent energy of something like this. This has four carbons. That would be a butane. So this is quite simply cyclobutane. Five carbons, cyclopentane. Six, that's a hexane. So this is cyclohexane. Very simple concept. If you're just naming the um, ring without substituents. You just look to see how many carbons you have in the ring. It's the alkane parent plus cyclo. Any questions? Well, you can have substituents on the ring, of course. And if you do have substituents, we have to find some way to name them. Now, just like when we were dealing with simple open chain alkanes, we said that we want to number this molecule so that we get the lowest number at the first point of difference. So we're going to look around our ring, decide one of the carbons will be carbon number one. Um, if we have more than one substituent on it, we're going to look at them and um, if it's a tie in terms of lowest number thing, we're going to give the lowest number alphabetically. All right, so look at this particular cyclohexane here. We have a methyl group and we have an ethyl group. Go ahead and number the carbons in both of these, and then we'll talk about how you do it. Let's call this one up here an isopropyl. Remember, alphabetically, that's an I. Well, in our first molecule, we can have carbon one on either the methyl or the ethyl. That's going to give us a one, two numbering. So it doesn't matter, except we default alphabetically, and the ethyl is going to get carbon 1. Over here, we have isopropyl, we have a methyl and an ethyl. Our numbering is going to be 1, 2, 3, regardless where we start. Therefore, we can again go alphabetically, and we'll let our ethyl group be number 1. Yeah? Really quick, um, that would be a nice little right? You don't right. include the whole list. Yeah, I see. All right, let's go ahead and name these compounds. Our parents here are going to be cyclohexane, and really all you have to do is string together the numbering for the substituents and what's there. our first compound, we have a 1-ethyl, we have a 2-methyl, again this is carbon-1 alphabetically, and our parent is a cyclohexane. All we do is string these together, 1-ethyl, 2-methyl, cyclohexane. 
no space here between methyl and cyclo. For our second one here, we have a 1-ethyl, we have a 2-methyl, and we have a 3-isopropyl. Remember, we could also name that as a methyl ethyl. Okay? But we'll just call it isopropyl here. Again, we're going to arrange them alphabetically. Our parent is cyclohexane, 1-ethyl, 3-isopropyl, 2-methyl, cyclohexane. Let's look at another example. <clears throat> Go ahead and assign carbon numbering to these guys, and then come up with a name. As far as numbering goes, <clears throat> we're going to have carbons number one and two, aren't we? Alphabetically, ethyl would win, wouldn't it? But if we let ethyl be carbon number one, our number sequence would be one, two, two. If we let this carbon be number one, our number sequence would be one, one, two. One, one, two is better than one, Therefore, this is carbon 1 and this is carbon 2. <clears throat> the uh, number sequence, the lowest number sequence, <clears throat> comes before alphabetical uh, listing in the rules. All right. So, we have methyl groups at carbon 1, ethyl group at carbon 2. We would simply call it 2-ethyl, 1,1-dimethyl cyclohexane. Remember, the di does not, is not considered for alphabetical purposes. Good morning. Any questions? Look at the numbering here. Alphabetically, bromine would win, wouldn't it? But if we let bromine be carbon one, then we would have substituents at one, three, and four. If we let ethyl be number one, we would have substituents at one, Two and four. This is the proper sequence. One, two, four is a lower sequence than one, two, four. Any questions on that? the name, sorry. 4-bromo, 1-ethyl, 2-methyl, cyclohexane. All right, let's look at a couple more here. Here we have a cyclohexane with two, I'm oh, sorry, a methyl and a chlorine. We have a bromine and we have an ethyl. Look for your lowest number sequence.
just a hint, pretty much whenever you have two substituents on the same carbon, that's going to scream at you, I am carbon number one. Okay? If we let this be carbon one, we would have substituents at one, one, two, and this is number five. If we let, say, this guy be number one, that would be one, two, two, four. This is the lowest number sequence. One, one, two, five beats out one, two, two, four. So we just put them all together. <clears throat> Let's see, alphabetically, we're going to have a 2-bromo first, aren't we? Then we're going to have a 1-chloro. We will have a 5-ethyl, and we'll have a 1-methyl. 2-bromo, 1-chloro, 5-ethyl, 1-methyl, cyclohexane. Any questions? Just for the heck of it, let's do a cyclopentane here. Our parent has five carbons in a ring. It's a cyclopentane. Only have one substituent, so this is really simple. Remember, we could call this a methyl ethyl, or we could call it an isopropyl. This is clearly going to be carbon number one, but if there's only one substituent on the ring, you don't even have to include the number. So we're just going to call this isopropyl cyclopentane. We could also call it methyl ethyl cyclopentane. Either one is certainly acceptable. Uh, if you do methyl ethyl, you do the ester. But not isopropyl. Any questions? Now, in our first one here, we have a dilemma. This is a cyclobutane up here, isn't it? And it's attached to a chain. First thing you have to decide is who's going to be the parent. What you do is simply look at the number of carbons in your side chain, compare it to the carbons in your cycloalkane. Whichever one has the most carbons wins. Therefore, we have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in a, in a chain here, and four carbons up there. This is going to be our parent. We have two substituents. They're both equally spaced on our new parent here. One's a cyclobutane, one's a methyl. We're going to let the cyclobutane win. Now we have two substituents. We have a hexane as a parent, a cyclobutyl, we'll call it, with the YL on, and of course a methyl. Two cyclobutyl, five methyl um, hexane. We do not name it as a cyclobutane because there are more carbons out here. Any questions? Now, 
Now, naming like this and drawing structures from names and stuff like that is something that we're going to do. It's something that you're going to do as an exercise um, on exams and something that you're going to do as an exercise both in lab reports and in quizzes. In order to do this, we use our structure drawing palette. Um, I had several questions from people on how you do this, so let's just take a quick break here, if we can get away with this. Hopefully it'll wake up. There it is. Almost. This is the JME drawing palette, okay? Um, let's say that we wanted to draw a dimethyl cyclohexane or something. What you would do is you simply grab the cyclohexane here and click out there. Boom, just like that. Perfect cyclohexane. You want to put substituents on it. Just go, click, click, make an isopropyl if you like. If you wanted to make a double bond in this ring, you would simply go here in the middle somewhere and click again. Remember, once you have built your structure based on a name or whatever you're supposed to do, go up here to the little smiley face. Here's the smile string. You select it, copy it, and then go back to Blackboard and paste it in. If we wanted to draw, say, a long chain branched alkane, you can do it this way. Or we'll put a benzene ring on it. If you want to attach another benzene ring, like you had to for naphthalene, you would simply go in the middle here. How about that? Any questions? If you um, want more information on how to do this, this little box up here opens the about and here's a help and it will open a page with lots and lots probably way too much help that you ever want to use it's a fairly simple thing to use <clears throat> um, the neat thing about a smile string is that it doesn't matter how you draw the molecule you draw it this way or you drew it backwards or upside down as long as the connectivity is the same, you will get the same smile string. So it is a really neat way to do this, and we're going to use this a lot in Blackboard. Again, you'll have um, questions like we just had. Um, here's some names, draw some structures, and then you have to paste the smiles back in for your quiz. Any questions? Yeah? What's the difference of that um, export chemical structure Get smile and get GME string. Is there oh, um, <clears throat> if you uh, the J JME string is something like this. Yeah, but what is that useful? Well, because if I let's see, does this have um, this doesn't have an input to uh, to do it but I think there's one in the program. Um, JME string defines what the molecule looks like in the palette. So I can uh, pre-program something like this, and it will instantly generate from the JME string. So that's a nice way to input structures. But you don't need to do that. You just need smiles. We have one more of these, don't we? So let's just do this. Remember when we have two things on one carbon, that's going to scream at you, carbon one. Looks to me like we're going to go counterclockwise to get our lowest sequence. So we're going to go this way. 
One, two, three, four, five. Here we have a side chain. Remember when you have a side chain, by definition, on the side chain, carbon number one is a point of attachment. So our side chain here is going to have five carbons. So six is still the parent. And we have a methyl group out here on our side chain in carbon number two. Go ahead and see if you can string together a name for this little guy. we have to include in our name. We're going to have a 113 trimethyl, aren't we? 113 trimethyl. We're going to have a 5-ethyl. Those are the easy parts. In carbon 2, we have a pentyl, don't we? And the pentyl has a methyl group and carbon 2. So we'll call that a 2-methyl pentyl. Once you decide all your pieces, simply string them together. 5-ethyl, 113-trimethyl. Then in carbon-2, we have a 2-methyl pentyl. And our parent is cyclopentane. Any questions? Well, we've done cyclopentane, cyclohexanes. I should do something a little different here. Go ahead and give me a name for this guy. Well, our parent is going to be our remembered ring, isn't it? And we have substituents next to each other. So here's our parent, and we have a 1, 2. On each carbon, we have a methyl group. So, very simply, we could call this 1, 2, dimethyl, Cyclopropane. Everybody happy with that? What, is it? what about the extra hydrogen? Oh, is that? Never mind. Yep, I just put the hydrogen on so you can see. All right. We're all happy with that name? This is what we just named, right? What would you call this one? Same parent. They're both 1, 2, and they're both dimethyl cyclopropane. They are clearly, however, not the same compound. They are constitutional isomers of some sort, aren't they? Not really constitutional because of connectivity. These are what we call stereoisomers. They're stereoisomers because they differ in their orientation in space. They have exactly the same connectivity. They both have a cyclopropane parent. They both have methyl groups 1 and 2. But, if you look at this, these two methyl groups are opposite each other, aren't they? These two methyl groups are right next to each other. 
They differ in their orientation in space. These are stereoisomers. Now we're going to spend a whole chapter on stereoisomers. How do we name these? What we're going to do, um, initially anyway, is simply to use the prefixes cis and trans. Cis refers to groups that are on the same side. In this case, the same side of our three-membered ring. They're both, remember the three-membered ring is black, it's planar, it's a triangle. And these are both pointing up. This would be cis, 1,2-dimethyl cyclopropyl. Over here we have, again, the same parent, but this one's pointing up, this one's pointing down. This is trans, 1,2-dimethyl cyclopropyl. Any questions? All right, we're going to come back to lots of, of exercises in stereochemistry in just a minute. But let's just talk a little bit about cycloalkanes in general. This is the concept of ring strain. Now this is a little cyclopropane, like we just saw. And I've got it slowly rotating around some axis here. What I want you to note as it goes by, of course, is that it's flat. Yes, it is. It's a triangle. It must be. But if you look at it here, we have, so after a full rotation, all of these hydrogens are eclipsed, aren't they? And remember when we talked about ethane and cyclo, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Butane itself, we said the eclipsed orientations were always the highest energy. That makes cyclopropane here a very high energy molecule. This energy is generally referred to as strain energy. Um, this is torsional strain. That's the energy from eclipsing. But there's more going on with poor cyclopropane. Remember, these are all sp cubed carbons. And they would all dearly love to have a bond angle of 109. Well, they don't. It's a triangle. So there's 60. That means that these are very highly strained. And frankly, they just really want to break open. Another way to look at it is um, in terms of orbitals. These are the sp3 orbitals that we're using to construct the sigma bonds. Again, they should be linear. If they were straight on, that's the highest energy. Here, they're obviously bent. <coughs> they're, uh, uh, the di uh, angle between all the carbons is 60. The angle between the orbitals is about 104. Our overlap is really poor. This means that this is a high energy molecule. It will undergo reactions. If you burn it, it actually gives off lots of energy as you open up this strained ring. If we look at other cycloalkanes, we just did cyclopropane. 60 degrees should be 109. Cyclobutane, it's a square. 90 degree bond angles. Again, we're off our 109. Even the five numbered ring, we're only at 108. Finally, when we get to cyclohexane, we'll see we can have perfect, well, um, the interior angles here would be 120, but cyclohexane can adopt a conformation where each of these carbons is a perfect tetrahedron. We'll talk about that in just a second. 
So there's ring strain in all of these. They're just a simple chart. Um, here's our strain energy in kilojoules per mole. Three, of course, is the highest. Four, right behind. Five, not too bad. Six, as we'll see, can you actually go to zero. When you start getting bigger rings, it goes up again because you're trying to open these bonds further than 109 as opposed to squeeze them down. So six is our optimum for a cycloalkane. Now, in order to relieve some of this ring strain, the um, proportional bonds, so the eclipsing, we'll see that molecules can adopt conformations. Remember, around all of these sigma bonds, we have free rotation. So for cyclobutane here, four carbons, instead of being flat, it tends to pucker. When it puckers, these become um, bigger than 90 degrees. They're still not perfect, but they're better than they were if the thing was flat. Five-membered ring. And remember, our bond angles on the pentagon would be 108. Need 109s. So we still have to do a bit of puckering in order to get there. And this leads us to our opening movie here, these are the dynamics of ring puckering in a cyclopentane. All the sigma bonds have free rotation, and you see it simply does gymnastics very, very, very quickly. We're talking 10 to the 6 times per second, and we have an average structure over all of these conformations. Any questions? So like I said, the champion for the cycloalkanes is cyclohexane. Cyclohexane can adopt this particular conformation. If you look at these, every carbon in here is a perfect tetrahedron. It kind of goes up, down, up, down, up, down, whatever. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, this particular conformation of cyclohexane has a name. We will call this the chair conformation. Now let's see. Let's go back in time. This is what it looked like. Remember, one end is up, one end is down. <clears throat> Think about a comfortable lawn chair. One end up, one end down. This is the chair conformation of cyclohexane. I will give you exercises and problems on exams where you will be asked to draw a cyclohexane in the chair conformation. We'll go through the steps as to how to draw a perfect chair in just a bit, but this is what we're talking about. One end is up, one end is down. Any questions? All right. If you look closely at cyclohexane, you'll note that the hydrogens in this are basically of two types. We have hydrogens, let's define what we'll call a ring plane. Okay? The ring plane is basically the average of all of these carbons. Okay, so that's our ring plane. Now, within this ring plane, you'll note that we have one group of hydrogens that are pointing straight up. 
and another group of hydrogens that are more or less pointing up and down within the ring plane. Ones that are pointing up and down at 90 degrees to the ring plane are referred to as axial hydrogens. Here's our ring plane. Up, 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 down, down, down at 90 degrees. Those are axial. The others, these guys, we are going to call them equatorial. They are within the equator of the ring plane. Now, I had a beautiful model made that I didn't bring, but this is a model, very fragile, it's going to fall apart before the day's over, but this should clearly show you. Here's our ring plane. Our green substituents are all pointing up and down at 90 degrees, and the yellows are all in the equator of the ring plane. Axial and equatorial. Now, on exams, when I ask you to draw a cyclohexane, I'm going to expect you to do it beautifully. So, we're going to have an art lesson here. Here's our axials, here's our equatorials. This is what a perfect cyclohexane is supposed to look like. <clears throat> our contrast here is off a little bit. There are hydrogen stuck here, but these are axial. And these are equatorial. This is axial too. So we're going to look at the steps that are involved in drawing this thing. Step one. All right, let's darken our background so we can see it. Again, these are our axials, all pointing at 90 degrees to our plane, and these are the equatorial sticking off at odd angles. All right, to draw this thing, first thing you want to do is draw your carbon backbone. So you're drawing your chair. You start somewhere, you go down, up, down, up, down, and close it. I'll pause while you draw your perfect chair. Once you have a perfect chair, the easiest thing to do is to draw the axial substitute. Now, every carbon is going to have one axial bond. As you've drawn these, the carbons that are up, in quotes, the axial bond will point straight up. The carbons that are down, the axial bond will point straight down. So your set of axial bonds should look like these. Straight up and straight down. So take your structure, go ahead and draw in your axial bonds. Now the axial bonds are really easy. Drawing in the equatorials properly 
does take a little bit of practice. The way you're going to do this is you're going to use the framework here from your six-membered ring, your framework, as a guide. First thing to note, let's consider these two bonds within our ring. They are parallel to each other if you've drawn your ring perfectly. The equatorial bonds that occur here and here are going to be parallel to these guys. So you use these as a guide, and then you can draw this and this parallel to it. So we have four sets of parallel lines. Our substituents are therefore going to look like that. Next, let's consider these parallel lines. Again, from the carbon network that you drew. The equatorial bonds at this and this position are also going to be parallel to those sides. Here it's real simple to see. You just look straight across to find the carbon going to be parallel here. So once you've done that, all you have to do is put in your next two equatorial lines. We only have two more, and we have two more bonds here that are parallel to each other. So let's look across from this guy. We're talking about the orientation here and the orientation here. Again, four parallel bonds. And all we do is draw our substituents to match. And presto, we have a perfect cyclohexane. Now, why do I care if you can draw a perfect cyclohexane? Well, first of all, I can, and, you know, I'd like you to be able to. But secondly, we're going to see it's very, very important to be able to draw a structure and you be able to show me clearly if a substituent is axial or equatorial at a given position. Okay? You have to be able to convey that information. And if you had substituents at, say, two or three carbons, and they had differing stereochemistries, you're going to have to be able to show those clearly. All right? So that's why we're doing this. Okay, that just takes a little bit of practice. What we're going to do now is go back and perform, hopefully, a little bit of magic on our model. Remember, on this model, I showed you the greens, all axial and the yellows were all equatorial. Now I am going to attempt to change the conformation here slightly. And when I do, I will perform magic. Uh, hopefully without this thing falling apart. I'm just going to raise one carbon up. 
for it. And now I'm going to try to bend this carbon down. We had a slight accident, but not fatal. Another one. I knew this was going to happen. I hate these models. But very quickly, and believe it or not, it worked. Suddenly, all of the greens are now equatorial, aren't they? And all of the yellows are axial. What we have done here is called a ring inversion. Ring inversion is shown here. Here you'll note all of the reds are axial. I pull one end up, pull the other end down, and suddenly all of the blues are axial, the reds are equatorial. One end goes up. Now you'll note when this gets up, they kind of bump it into each other. And now we are equatorial reds. This is axial reds. This is called a ring inversion. In a ring inversion, every substituent that was axial becomes equatorial. And every substituent that was equatorial becomes axial. Now, as part of the exercise in organic chemistry, you are going to have to be able to take a given cyclohexane with substituents and do a ring inversion and draw the other structure. Now, this process happens very, very quickly. Um, again, this is 10 to the 6 times per second for a simple cyclohexane. You'll note that we start off in our chair here, right? Look at this intermediate structure. This doesn't look like a chair anymore, does it? That intermediate structure is referred to as a boat. Both ends up. This is the boat cyclohexane. All right, we've seen chair. Let's look at boat a little more closely. In our boat cyclohexane, both ends are up. And again, we're taking these two hydrogens here. They're one four to each other on the ring. And we're forcing them together. They're not happy with that, are they? Not only that, but in our boat cyclohexane, you'll note we have eclipse interactions everywhere else, don't we? So this is a higher energy form. The chair is the most stable. The bone is a high energy. If we look at it head on, again, you can see eclipse interactions everywhere. High energy population. Um, Cyclohexane isn't stupid. It actually can remedy some of this by forming what's called the twist boat. Now, you will never be asked to draw this. Don't worry about that. But what you do is you simply take this and you just kind of pucker everything a little bit to try to relieve some of the eclipsing interactions. This is still much more unstable relative to the chair. This is a very silly little cartoon. To put this impression in your mind as to what a chair and boat is, again, our chair confirmation looks like this. One end up, one end down. 
a vote confirmation looks like this. Both ends are. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so the ring inversion, does that occur randomly? Or it occurs constantly. Okay. Constantly, very rapidly, depending on the substituents that are attached. All right, let's look at a ring inversion. <clears throat> Here I have a methyl cyclohexane. <clears throat> In our methyl cyclohexane, I have my methyl group equatorial. I do a ring inversion. So when I do that, I take this end, move it up, so it's there. This end, move it down, so it's there. The rule is everything that was axial becomes equatorial, right? So we started off with an equatorial methyl on this carbon, same carbon. If it's equatorial here, it must be axial. Ring inversion goes back and forth like this very rapidly. Which of these do you think is going to be the preferred isomer at equilibrium? This is an exercise in steric inverts. Remember, steric refers to size matters. In this one, if we look at our axial groups, and I just put in the top half for clarity, here we have three hydrogens, and they're all sticking up. Now they're <coughs> um, close to each other, but they're really not that bad. Okay? A methyl group, however, is a carbon with three hydrogens attached. It is much bigger. When we put our methyl group axial, the large methyl group is now pushing against these hydrogens, and this is therefore much less stable. As a rule of thumb, Axial is going to be unstable. Equatorial is more stable. Let's look at another example. Here is bromocyclohexane. Bromocyclohexane. Here I've done a ring inversion. It was equatorial. Now it's axial. Right? Bromine. Well, you thought a methyl group was big. Bromine is huge. If we take and we put this huge thing equatorial, it fits. But if we put it axial, it would really, really interfere with our other axial hydrogens. Equatorial is always good. Axial is almost always bad. Now, if we have more than one substituent, there are actually, uh, there's a table in your book that gives actual energies for interactions. You can add those all up if you like, but you almost always get exactly the same answer if you simply say, I want to have the greatest number of equatorial substituents. Fewest axial, greatest number of equatorial. Let's look at another example here. This is ethyl cyclohexane. I've drawn it axial. Um, the reason that this is so unstable well, this is the CH2, it's pushing on these hydrogens. But remember, this is a simple sigma bond, and we can rotate around it, can't we? If we rotate around that, this is what it would look like. 
see our methyl group here, this one on the end. These are our other two hydrogens. They get walked every time they come down. Very, very unstable. <clears throat> Therefore, we would predict that in the equilibrium mixture, we would have very little of the axial ethyl group. Now, the king of this is the tert-butyl group. Tert-butyl is, again, trivial nomenclature. This could also be called a dimethyl ethyl. But basically, we have a carbon with three methyl groups attached. This is the size of a basketball. This is so big that it's virtually impossible to put it axial. This is referred to as a ring that is frozen with the terbutyl always equatorial, and you just ignore where everything else is. This is what our terbutyl would look like with this in the um, equatorial position. Here's our methyl, our carbon with three methyls attached. Uh, if we make this face filling, you can see just how big that little lump is, and it's virtually impossible to get it axial. Just doesn't fit. All right, so later, we're going to come back to axial and equatorial groups, and we're going to practice drawing these things and doing ring inversions. But before we do that, Let's return to the concept of stereochemistry around these rings. For cyclopropane, we looked at this. Green here would more or less represent chlorine. We would look at our first one. Here's our ring plane. These are clearly on the same side. They are cis, aren't they? We would call this cis dichloro cyclopropane. Here you can clearly see these are on opposite sides. And this is trans dichloro cyclopropane. Now if we had a four member ring, how many dichloral isomers would we make? Well, let's start off with a 1,2 dichloral, right? We could do just like we did with cyclopropane. We could put them both on the same side of the ring plane, make them cis, or we could put them on opposite sides and make them trans. So this is 1,2-dichloro, cis, and trans, right? But we could also move our chlorine from carbon number 2 out here to carbon number 4. If we do that, we can also add two isomers with this one. They're both above the ring plane. These are cis. With this one, they're on opposite sides of our ring plane, and they're trans. So, if I ask you how many stereoisomers of, one, of dichloral cyclobutane you would say four. Two of the one two isomers and two of the one four isomers. Okay? Well, of course, we're going to do five number rings next. I've drawn my five number ring in a little bit of a pucker because we all know it does that. 
we have this one sticking up. This one is kind of sticking up. But if you compare it to this group sticking down, these are clearly on the same side of the ring plane. This is an up. This is an up. Here we have this sticking more or less in the ring plane, same with this one. If you ever have any real question, look at the other group. This hydrogen is clearly down. This one is clearly up. This is our cis isomer. So this is 1,2-dichlorocyclopentane. We could have 1,3. This is in our ring plane, so is this. Look at the other group as it's that. Hydrogen is clearly down. Hydrogen is clearly down. These are cis. You draw it another way. Now you can see these are very clearly up and down. These are trans. So this is 1,3-dichloro, right? Is there another isomer I can draw? What if I move my chlorine to this carbon? Is that different? Nope, because that would still be 1,2. So if I put my chlorine here, it's still exactly the same. So there are four isomers we can draw for a cyclopentane. Two of them are 1, 2. Two of them are 1, 4. I'm sorry, 1, 3. Finally, cyclohexane. We're going to see we have six possible isomers. <clears throat> These are going to be axial and equatorial versions. Well, let's start off with this one. We have a chlorine that is axial. Next door to it, we have a chlorine that is equatorial. Right? We can have this one, again, they're one, two, and this is equatorial, and this is equatorial. This is clearly cis. So this is trans, and these are cis. Let's move our chlorine over one atom. Now both chlorines I've drawn here are equatorial, aren't they? If I change the position here, this guy is up, this one is clearly down, that would be a trans, wouldn't it? Yeah? So is it necessarily you have one axial one? It depends on where they are on the ring. Uh, we'll see that in just a second. Finally, let's move our chlorine over one more carbon to carbon number four. Here I've drawn one axial, one equatorial. These are on the same side. They would be cis. This is up, this is up. If I invert this one, this is now in the ring plane, so is this, they're both equatorial, and they would be trans to each other. As a grouping, we will call all of these guys, here's our ring plane, we're going to call all of these guys cis, and all of these guys trans. So 
look at them. <clears throat> Remember our ring plane here. This is pointing up from the ring plane. So is this. They are cis. This is pointing up from the ring plane. So is this. They're cis. This is pointing up. So is this. They're cis. We're pointing up. We're pointing down. They're trans. We're pointing up. We're pointing down. They're trans. Up, down, trans. Six possible isomers. Any questions on this? <clears throat> we will have just general rules. I have that, a question. Oh, the second one, um, on the right, this one. This one really looks like for real. It's this one is up, one is down. Yep, well, remember, axials are always perfectly down or up. And the other one is the equatorial. Back up here just a little bit. <coughs> this is one and two. Here are axial lines, straight down, straight up. Therefore, these must both be equatorial. Now you look at it and you say, all right, this one is pointing up, this one is pointing down, up and down means trans. Up and up means cis. Again, up and up, cis, up and up, up and up, up, down. One four, diequatorial, this guy right here, is the classic example of trans. Now, just to make this interesting, remember all these isomers can also undergo ring inversions, can't they? So let's practice doing a couple simple ring inversions here. <clears throat> here I've drawn a boat, cyclohexane, with 1,4 dichloral groups. When I do this, if I go ahead and um, convert this into a chair, this is one of the chairs that I can draw. It's a 1,4 dichloral cyclohexane. Now in this thing that I've drawn, if you look at my chlorines, what is their orientation? Are they axial or equatorial? Axial. They're both axial, aren't they? And we remember Axial is bad, right? Therefore, draw this in its most stable conformation. That means you're going to have to do a ring inversion and redraw the structure. Remember our little movie? How did you do a ring inversion? You grabbed one, moved it down, grabbed the other end, moved it up. We got from here to here simply by flipping one in and then tipping it up. <clears throat> Let's do a ring inversion. Grab this one, move it down. Grab this one, move it up. Okay, okay, come on. There we go. So we're 
simply taking this carbon, moving it down, this carbon, moving it up. Now we have a chair. It's the opposite chair, isn't it? And instead of both points being axial, they are now both equatorial. The simplest way to do this, I think, is just to look at the carbon skeleton for this, the chair you start with. All right, so you can draw just the carbon skeleton. The down, up, down, up, down, up. Then start off by drawing the opposite chair. So up, down, up, down, up, down. Knowing that the chlorines are going to invert, go ahead and put in your axial and equatorial bonds and stick the two chlorines equatorial. If you ever have <coughs> real difficulties, real problems, um, <coughs> confirming the structure that you drew was right, just, just do the simple test on spatial orientation. If you look at this carbon, we have chlorine up, hydrogen downish, right? We ring invert, chlorine up, hydrogen down. Haven't broken any bonds, chlorine is still above the hydrogen. Over here, hydrogen is above the chlorine, Hydrogen is above the chlorine. Let's do it again. Look at this guy and draw it in its most stable conformation. I would start off just by drawing your skeleton. Here we have this carbon down, so you want to draw your basic six-membered skeleton starting with the carbon up. Now you look at this thing and what do you say? Well, what you say is, oh my goodness, we have a turbutyl group that's axial. We know that's not going to be right, correct? So we're going to redraw our ring and make this thing equatorial. We know that. Go ahead, draw it, try it. Nobody's going to watch. The operation is we're going to move this carbon up, this carbon down. We have a methyl group here that is equatorial, isn't it? In our final structure, what's this going to be? Axial. <coughs> this one is axial. What will it be? Equatorial. So go ahead and draw your framework, <coughs> put in the ax axial equatorial bonds for carbons 1, 2, and 4, and then fill them in. Terbutyl will be equatorial. This methyl will be axial. This one will be equatorial. Our turbutyl group here is now equatorial. 
The methyl here on this carbon is now axial. The methyl on this carbon is now equatorial. All right, let's look at this guy. Now, just to be mean, I've given this to you as a boat, right? That's a mean thing to do. What you have to do is convert this boat into a chair. So you have some place to start. We have methyl groups 1, 2, and 4. <clears throat> so go ahead and draw a chair. Simplest way is remember you're just going to grab either end and move it down. Let's grab this end, move it down like that. Now look at our geometries. On this carbon, which is the one right here, Methyl is above hydrogen, right? So on this carbon, methyl is still above hydrogen. This is the one we drag down. Hydrogen above methyl. Hydrogen is above methyl. This guy really hasn't changed. Hydrogen is still above methyl right here. So step one, you do this and you say, okay, I did it. I just drew a really nice looking chair. But is it the most stable chair? How many axial groups do we have here? We have two axial methyls, only one equatorial. If we did a ring inversion, we would have two equatorials one axial. So now, take this, draw the other chair. When we do that, this will become an equatorial methyl, so will this one, and this guy will be axial. ring inversion. I'm going to drag one end up, one end down, and I should get something that looks like this. I dragged it up, dragged it down. I now have two equatorial methyls, one axial. They look different because they are. This is the ring inversion. <clears throat> this carbon is this one, and it simply has been pulled down to this position. This carbon is this one. This one has been pulled up, so it's there. <clears throat> Relative to this, we have a methyl group in the back, another CH2, terp-butyl, and another methyl. Just takes practice. Speaking of practice, go ahead and do these two. Draw them in their most stable confirmation.
as you draw these, I put in lots of hydrogens here that we don't really need. You don't need to put those in. Just make sure you show the stereochemistry at the groups with the substituents. I will pause for a moment while you do this. Step number one, we look at our first one and say, <clears throat> is this by any chance the most stable conformation? Gee, that would be nice if it was. Well, of course it isn't, because we have two axial metals. Right? Therefore, we're going to have to draw the other chair. So instead of starting down, you want to draw your backbone starting up. Start up, you're going to go down, up, down, up. So draw your backbone. We could call this carbon number one. It has an axial methyl, it will now have an equatorial methyl. Carbon number three has an axial methyl, it will now have an equatorial methyl. And the structure is our two methyls. That's bad. Here we've made them both equatorial. That's much better. Carbon one, equatorial methyl, used to be axial. Carbon three used to be axial. Now it's equatorial. Um, no, you can't do that. That's breaking bonds. Even though my model fell apart when I was ring inverting, you're not allowed to break bonds. All right, this next guy is in a boat. You're going to have to fix that, right? How about you take one end here, simply drag it down, draw another chair, so start off with this guy up, draw another chair, just with this methyl group down. Methyl is going to be above hydrogen in your structure. Start your backbone up, up, down. And down. When we do this, we're going to wind up with a structure like this. So we drag this one. Well, actually, I guess I did the opposite eyes up, sorry. I drag this one down instead of the other one. So there's a CH2, there's a CH2. When we do this, we note that on this carbon here, 
We have hydrogen above methyl. This carbon here, hydrogen up, methyl down. This one, methyl is above hydrogen, methyl is above hydrogen. We have one axial, one equatorial. If we ring flipped again, what will we have? One axial, one equatorial. So in this particular structure, you're stuck with one axial group. Is that one? <clears throat> well, the boat is always unstable. So you're going to shoot for a chair, but in both chairs, you're going to have one axial, one equatorial. Because if they flip, if they flip, this one becomes equatorial, but this one gets axial. Now, I understand that in drawing these abstract things um, more or less out of context is it, kind of challenging right now. But we're going to see that stereochemistry around a ring is actually very important. And as we start doing reactions and things like that, we will have particular reactions, say of an alkene, that will give one, two diequatorial or diaxial products, or one, two axial equatorial, etc. So that's where all this is going to become important. But you need to be able to look at those structures figured out the stereochemistry, and talk about it. All right, as if all of this isn't bad enough, remember when we, hopefully, um, on your lab report, you drew a structure for naphthalene, where we had two benzene rings fused together, right? Well, we can also get rings fused from simple cycloalkanes. I'm just going to show you these. You're not going to be required to draw these right now. Later on, maybe, but not right now. This is referred to as the ring junction. We can have two isomeric ring junctions. One that is called a trans. So we have one hydrogen up, one hydrogen down. And the other is a cis, where we have them both on the same side. We've all heard of steroids, right? In steroids, you have an alkane, cycloalkane backbone. This typically is a series of trans ring junctions. Very important stereochemistry here. All right, how would we draw this in a chair conformation? Well, what you would do is just start off with your backbone. You can all do this now. Up, down, up, down. Remember as you do this, these two bonds are parallel, these two are parallel, and so are those. Just a series of parallel lines. Now, we're dealing with the hydrogens here at our ring junction. I've drawn them trans, haven't I? If they're trans, does that mean they're axial or equatorial? Well, if they were both axial, they would be trans, right? If they're both equatorial, they'd also be trans but we have no other place to put the rest of our ring. So let's just start off making them axial. And I've also put in our two equatorial bonds. So how do we take this and draw in our next cyclohexane? Simply look at it. This guy right here 
this little structure, that's the nose of our next ring, isn't it? All we have to do is take and fill in the rest of our ring, like that. And this is our trans ring junction. You can see this is nice and flat, isn't it? Typically, steroids are nice, long, flat molecules. Now, let's see what would happen if we had a cis ring junction. Going to do exactly the same thing. Let's start off with just the backbone. Now, I put in two hydrogens. And I've made them cis, right? Cis means they're both on the same side, so one must be axial and the other must be equatorial. <clears throat> now, this is an equatorial bond. This is the axial bond. Now, what we have to do is simply realize that we're going to draw our six-numbered ring, but it has to be vertical here. That is, the other bond here has to be parallel to this one, so it's going to be here. And it's going to go in looking something like this. These two have to be parallel. These two have to be parallel. And so do those two. There we are. We simply extend it down, put another nose here. Now, <clears throat> make our bonds. This is our cis ring junction, I'm sorry, our trans ring junction, and this guy is cis. You can clearly see that simply by changing the stereochemistry here, we have totally changed the shape of this molecule, haven't we? If you had a steroid and it was supposed to, to bond to here where we had a trans junction, and you tried to feed it as a cis, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't fit. Stereochemistry is very, very important in biological recognition. All right, let's just take what we know and work a couple simple problems. Go ahead and take these names. Draw me a structure. <clears throat> now, the question here is um, very general in terms of what you're doing. It simply says draw the structure. So you don't have to draw these in 3D, but you have to somehow show the stereochemistry. Start off by drawing the 3D structure. So kind of make your cyclopentane and put in a trans 1,3 dibromo. Lots of ways you can do this. <clears throat> pick the simplest, pick the one that works for you. You could draw the thing in a full pucker, or you could just kind of take your cyclopentane ring and look at it more or less from the side so that you can clearly see the ups and downs. 
trans, so they're going to be on opposite sides of this ring plane. Probably the simplest way to draw this would be like that. I've kind of distorted my five-member ring a little bit, so I'm looking at it on edge. So I can show one up and one down. Now there's another way we can show this. And that's using what we call wedge bonds. A wedge bond is going to show the stereochemistry as either being up or down as you're looking at it. If the wedge is solid coming toward you, that's an up. If it's dashed, it'll be down. So if we drew this thing with a wedge bond, we could just simply draw our pentagon. We could say this bromine is coming up, that's this one. This bromine is going down, that's this one. So two ways you can draw this. All right, we have a cyclohexane with groups in one and three. Draw a backbone. Identify one carbon as number one, the other one is number three, and put in your axial and equatorial bonds. So do that first. Just draw your backbone, draw axial and equatorials one, three relative to each other. Now this is cis, and they're one, three. So we have to make sure they're on the same side. As you look at your axial and equatorials, if they're on the same side, they would both have to be axial, or they would both have to be equatorial. Obviously, the axial is bad. We don't like axial, do we? So we would draw something like this. With our backbone, we do a carbon one and three, put in our axial equatorial bonds. Realize these must both be on the same side, so they're either both axial or they're both equatorial. Clearly, they have to both be equatorial. Didn't you say the cis is more equatorial, more axial? Like when they're cis? Um, that's when they're 1, 2. One, two. This is 1, 3. Again, the simplest way to do it is to look and just identify your axial bonds. These are both up. These, therefore, are both down. If they're both down, they're cis. If they're both up, they're cis. I'll go ahead and draw this using wedge bonds. So you want to draw a perfect hexagon. Go to carbon number one. We need to show our methyl group and a carbon three, our isopropyl group, on the same side. So we have a perfect hexagon. These both must be on the same side. We could draw it like that. We're saying that methyl group and the isopropyl group are both coming towards us or away from us, but they both have to be the same.
in order to be 6. question. All right, here's a couple more. Draw the structure of cyclopentyl methyl cyclopropane. Our paradis cyclo, what is it? Oh, cyclopentane. Our paradis cyclopentane. So just draw a perfect pentagon. Now attached to that is a cyclopentyl methyl. What in the world is that? <clears throat> Remember, our point of attachment is going to come last in our, our name here. So that's just a carbon. And to that, we have attached a cyclopentyl group. So the carbon here, single carbon, is attached to the cyclopentane and attached to this single carbon with CH2 is another cyclopentane. And there it is. Here's our parent. Well, that could be the parent, but we'll say this is our parent. We have attached to it. Methyl group. And instead of one of its hydrogens, it has a cyclopentyl attached. Cyclopentyl methyl cyclopentane. Trans 1 chloro 2 methyl cyclopropane. Cyclopropane, three membered ring. Our substituents are in carbons one and two. They're trans, so one is up and one is down. We could draw it like this. One is up. One is down. Go ahead and draw this using wedgies. <clears throat> to draw wedges, you would draw a perfect triangle. Have one wedge bond coming up, one wedge bond going down, one with a chlorine, one with a methyl. Any questions? Trans 1 3 dimethyl cyclobutane. Cyclobutane, four membered ring. We have substituents 1 and 3. They're trans, so one is up and one is down. You can take and draw your cyclobutane ring kind of squished on edge. And that way you can show up and down very clearly. Go ahead and draw it with wedges. You draw a perfect square. You need two wedges, one up and one down.
Now this next one is really simple. Cycloctane is our parent, right? <clears throat> this trains you to draw a perfect stop sign. And somewhere on that, we simply have to put a six carbon straight chain. Are your stop sign. Pick a carbon and draw six carbons side chain. And it should look something like a little tadpole or whatever. Two more here. Cis, one methyl, read nitro, cyclopentane. Nitro group is an O2, remember. Attached to the nitrogen. Start off with your cyclopentane. Need to show nitro group and the methyl on the same side. <coughs> We draw our five-member ring. We have substituents one and three. One's a nitro, one's a methyl, and they are on the same side. Draw it also with veggies. We draw our five-member ring. We can either have our wedge bonds both coming up, like we did earlier, or both going down. They must both be the same, however. Now, just for something to look forward to, when we get to chapter 5, we'll see, actually, that it does make a difference that this molecule that I've shown here, with both of these down, is actually different than the molecule with them both up. They are mirror images, but that's chapter 5. Last one here, trans 1, 2 dibromocyclohexane. Very simple. Draw your backbone. Go to carbons 1 and 2. Put in axial equatorial groups. If they are trans, the two bromines must be either both axial or both equatorial. We know darn well putting them axial is bad, so draw them equatorial. Very simple. Cyclohexane. <clears throat> oh, here. Just <clears throat> here I put this in with both of them back. This is the one with them both forward. Again, we will see next chapter that those are actually 
mirror images of each other. But that's later. All right, for this guy, we want to draw our six numbered ring. One, two. I put them both equatorial. One up, one down. That makes them trans. Go ahead and draw it using wedge bonds. Bonds you simply need. You simply need <clears throat> to draw your perfect hexagon. Show one up and one down. Doesn't matter which is which. out is just a very simple little worksheet with eight multiple choice questions. I will pause for about eight minutes and you quickly work these multiple choice questions and then we will look at them. Your exam will be a mixture of drawing structures, names, and there will be a few multiple choice thrown in. All right. Wait is over. Which of these is trans one three dimethyl? If they're trans, and they must be going opposite, right? Here we have up, down, this and down, down. That would be cis. Up, up is cis. Up, up is cis. That is trans. One axial, one equatorial. Which of these is trans one four dimethyl? Well, gee, those are one three, aren't they? So is that. This is 1-4, and they're both equatorial. This is 1-4, axial equatorial. So which of these two are trans? This one is equatorial. This one is equatorial. This one you can clearly see. They are on the same side, so that is a cis, and that is trans. Which of these will give a more stable conformational isomer following a ring flip? Remember, in a ring inversion, everything axial becomes equatorial and vice versa. We have two equatorials here. That's about as good as you're going to get. Here we have two axials. That's about as bad as you could get. Axial equatorial. If we flip this one, we would still wind up with axial equatorial, right? <clears throat> this is diequatorial. It would be diaxial. The one that works is 
makes this guy, both of these become equatorial. All right, look at this guy. In its most stable conformation, what is true regarding it? Or I guess which of these statements is true? In its most stable, both methyl groups will be equatorial. Is that true? That's not even possible, is it? Because one is axial, one is equatorial. If we did a ring flip, this would be equatorial, that would be axial. So no, they are always going to be cis to each other. In its most stable conformation, both axials will be active. Yeah, will be axial. No, same reason. Let's look at D. In its most stable, all substituents will be equatorial. Well, that's impossible, isn't it? Therefore, in this one, chlorine will be equatorial. Right now, it's axial, so it's just methyl. So when we ring invert, this will become equatorial, so will this, and this poor guy is forced axial. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, right now, which one is axial, which one is equatorial? The methyl right here is equatorial, and these guys are both axial. So when we flip, we'll have two equatorials, one axial. This guy, <clears throat> we have an isopropyl, a chlorine, and we have a methyl. Right now, <clears throat> we have an axial chlorine and an axial methyl. This is an equatorial isopropyl. Now that's pretty big. But here we have two axials, one equatorial. We're shooting for two equatorials, one axial. So if we ring invert, the methyl group, which is now axial, would be equatorial. The chlorine, which is axial, will be equatorial. And the isopropyl will be forced axial. The best answer is this one. In reality, uh, the isopropyl is big enough that this isn't going to form a nice chair. It's going to be some sort of a distorted chair. Remember how we saw a twist boat kind of all tangled up on itself? <clears throat> this is going to be the same sort of thing, um, trying to minimize all of these interactions. But just using the rule of the maximum number of equatorials, A is the best answer. Wouldn't C also be correct? Hmm? Why wouldn't C also be correct? Uh, the isopropyl group will be axial. Oh, you're right, it is also correct. Because this will be four seven. Huh, I hadn't thought about that. Quickly change the slide. <laughs> All right, which of these is a conformational isomer following ring inversion of A? In A, we have two equatorial methyls, and there are one, three, two axial methyls. So we're looking for two equatorial methyls that are one, three. Here, both hydrogens are axial, that means these guys are clearly uh, equatorial. Here we have axial equatorial. Here we have axial equatorial, axial equatorial. A is the one that works. Here we have chlorine and a methyl axial and a methyl equatorial. So we're looking for substituents at carbons 1, 3, and 5. 
chlorine and the methyl must be equatorial, and this guy must be axial. So let's see, chlorine, methyl, equatorial, this guy, axial. Here we have <coughs> chlorine, methyl, equatorial, this guy, axial. Here we have equatorial, equatorial, equatorial. That's not going to work. Equatorial, axial. I think this guy probably works best. And the last one. In this guy, in its most stable conformation, what is true? <clears throat> well, we have two axial methyls, don't we? If we make this our most stable, both of these are going to be equatorial. That is the choice A. Any questions? <clears throat> All right, the lab for Thursday is 1.2. 1.2 is 